In modern endurance racing, Toyota is a force of nature. They are reigning WEC champions, having won their fifth championship in a row in 2023. And despite a surprise victory by Ferrari at Le Mans, Toyota remain one of the most decorated manufacturers to have raced in Saab, winning five times in a row from 2018 to 2022. But things weren't always so rosy for the Japanese giant. Out of the past, into a thousand tomorrows, comes a car made of the right stuff. The 1982 Toyota Celica, aerodynamically conceived to be efficient, not just different. In the early 1980s, Toms, in partnership with Toyota, had experimented with modifying a road-going Celica for competition in the 1983 All Japan Sports Prototype Championship. Celica. Fielding the 82C and 83C in rounds 1 and 3 respectively, achieving a single podium in the opening round, but this was little more than a proof of concept. Our story begins in earnest a couple of years later, in 1985. Toyota was reaching a peak, though they might not have known it at the time, of an astronomical rise in revenue and market share that had begun about a decade before. They had gone from a reasonably sized Japanese automaker to a global automotive titan. But they weren't famous for their performance cars, far from it, and while they did have some sporty offerings, what they really wanted was an international racing pedigree to sell them with. 1982 had seen the introduction of the Group C class to European sports car racing, a pure prototype class that allowed any manufacturer with money to burn a chance to prove that they were in fact the best. Toyota wanted in on the action, and so they threw some bills on the fire and partnered with Tachi Oiwa Motorsport, better known as Toms, and Constructor Doma to build and race the Toyota Toms 85C. The 85C, meaning Group C and 1985, would be going up against the established racing force of Porsche and the up-and-coming championship threat of Jaguar. But instead of just handing the racing department a blank check, they decided to proceed with caution, developing a new aluminium chassis with a sleek body to match, but trying to save time and money by using a familiar power plant. Unlike Porsche's 3.6-litre turbocharged flat six, and even more unlike Jaguar's 6.2-litre naturally aspirated V12, Toyota chose to develop the 2.1-litre 40 GT inline four from their Celica rally car. While the engine was battle-tested, with the Celica Twin Can Group B rally car becoming known as the King of Africa thanks to its performance in the Kenyan stage of the WRC, it was inevitably going to be down on power compared to its competitors in Group C. 1985, therefore, was very much Toyota testing the water. They only competed in one single round of the WSC that year, Le Mans, and they managed a best finish of 12th place. The 85C did compete in all six rounds of the JSPC, however, claiming three second place finishes, but never quite victory. For a first year though, the direction seemed good, and so they pushed on to 1986. But first, a quick word from today's sponsor. Browsing the web is something we all do a lot. It's how you're watching this video, and it's pretty much what I do for a living. So it's important that your web browser can give you the best web browsing experience out there. This is an advert for Opera, the web browser that I really do use every day. Opera comes with features that just make sense, like a built-in ad blocker to tidy up your web browsing experience and load web pages faster, top-notch security features for your peace of mind, and one of my personal favorites, Tab Islands. Being able to organize my tabs so easily is quite simply a game changer. Being able to easily see at a glance where everything is not only keeps me sane, but saves me time every day. Especially while doing research for videos. I once counted 50 tabs open at once. If that's not enough, Opera also includes Aria, a free generative AI tool built right into the browser. Using Aria to translate and summarize old forum threads and ancient websites has helped me a lot especially while researching obscure topics where there's very little information in English. So go to the link below and take your browsing experience to the next level by downloading Opera for free.
Thanks to Opera for sponsoring this video, and now back to Toyota. With confidence high, the 85C was extensively modified. The focus was on generating more downforce. And in the end, the car looked absolutely nothing like its predecessor. They adopted the long tail style that seemed to be working for Porsche, extending the bodywork with the hopes of creating more downforce. However, it retained the same drivetrain and chassis as the 85C. The older car was used in the first two rounds of the JSPC, where it managed third place in round one and second place in round two, before the 86C took over Tom's effort from round three. The car was quick, but up against Porsche's 956 and 962C, it struggled to make a major impact. Round four saw Tom's claim another second place, but this would turn out to be the 86C's best finish for that season. It spent the remainder of the season tumbling down the order, finishing the final race behind even its own predecessor. In Europe, the 86C was once again entered into the 24 Hours of Le Mans. Two cars started the race, neither of them finished, both succumbing to mechanical failures. Having gotten so close to success so many times, the feeling in Toyota was that success was not just possible, but it was within touching distance. Their partnership with Toms became closer, forming a new racing entity, Toyota Team Toms. 1987 would see the introduction of, you guessed it, the 87C, a further evolution of the concept that moved away from the previous year's long tail philosophy back to short tails and distinct wings. This was no rehashing of the 85C, however. They had a new engine. The 40 GT was out, and it was replaced with fellow 2.1 litre inline four cylinder 3S GT. Make no mistake, however, despite the fact these engines had the same displacement and the same number of cylinders, the 3S GT was a far more formidable power unit, capable of pushing significantly more power. For 1987, the All Japan Endurance Championship became the All Japan Sports Prototype Championship, or JSPC. The 87C was present from the first round, managing a third place finish on debut, losing out once again to the familiar first place hogging Porsche 962C. Round two, the famous thousand kilometers of Fuji, saw vindication for Toyota as they were finally able to take victory over longtime rivals Porsche, finishing a substantial five laps up. After years of fighting, they finally had a real taste of glory. Round three, this time in the hands of Doma's own race team, the 87C was relegated to a bronze finish before Toyota Team Toms claimed yet another win in round four. Round five functioned not only as round five of the JSPC, but also round 10 of the World Sports Car Championship. Unfortunately, in the 87C's second attempt at a thousand kilometers of Fuji, it did not go so well as the first time. One car failed to start, the other failed to finish. The same was true at Le Mans, where once again, the team was unable to get their car to the end of the race intact. For 1988, they introduced the 88C, an incremental step forward that didn't translate to results. They did finish Le Mans this time, but a less than impressive 12th and 24th place. And in the JSPC, the new car didn't manage a podium finish in any of the six rounds. A disappointing step backwards for the team, who now not only had to worry about fighting Porsche, but the upwardly mobile forces of Jaguar and now Sauber. During 1988, Toyota had tested a new idea. In a couple of races in Japan, they had fielded the 88CV, a car that was not powered by an inline four, rather a 3.2 litre V8. Not only that, but the car was built around a brand new carbon monocoque chassis courtesy of Doma, and the hope was that for 1989, they might be able to mount a triumphant return to the top of the timesheet. For 1989, Toyota competed in the JSPC, but also for the first time, every round of the WSC. The cars, Toyota ran both the old 88C and the new 89C that year, 
made almost no impact at all on the WSC, never troubling the podium once despite a promising pole position in the first qualifying session. On their home turf, however, Toyota Team Toms fared much better, finishing second in round four and managing the outfit's only victory that year at the very final round. While Toyota had seen flashes of success in their now five full years of competition, the hope had always been to achieve more. Toyota, Doma and Toms had built and raced capable racing cars, but their successes were too few and too far between. Something needed to change. The 90 CV started on the front foot in the JSPC winning the opening round ahead of Nissan and their R90 CP. However, the best it could achieve for the remainder of the season was a pair of third place finishes. Its predecessor, the 89 CV, actually managed to take a victory at the final round, a bittersweet victory for Toyota, I'm sure. In Europe, the story was even worse. They fielded the 90 CV in the WSC but I'm not sure their competitors even noticed. It failed to finish a lot of the races, and the ones it did, it never came close to a podium. Le Mans, which in 1990 wasn't actually part of the WSC calendar, was contested by Toyota, and it was their best finish yet in the event, with an impressive sixth place overall finish, but dreams of winning still seemed far-fetched. 1991 saw the introduction of Group C's controversial 3.5 litre formula. You may already know this story, but for the uninitiated, here's the lowdown. Group C sports car racing in Europe and North America and Japan, thanks to regulatory overlap, was extremely popular in the 1980s and into the early 1990s. Leadership inside the FIA either saw this as an opportunity or a threat, depending on your school of thought. Insiders claimed that the new 3.5 litre formula, which forced top class C1 cars to use 3.5 litre naturally aspirated engines, or be forced to compete in the lower C2 class with heavy restrictions, was a way to share the WSC's recent massive success with Europe's other major racing series, Formula One. The new 3.5 litre formula was pretty much a copy and paste job from F1's rulebook at the time, and the claim was that the change would introduce new engine suppliers to Formula One and allow existing Formula One engine suppliers to more easily delve into the realms of sports car racing, should they choose to do so. The more cynical, but unfortunately more realistic view is that it was a deliberate attempt to harm the WSC. Weeding out manufacturers unwilling to invest the money necessary to develop a new 3.5 litre engine, and poaching the ones that were to come and join F1 more exclusively. Having the dual benefit for Formula One of not only introducing new engine suppliers, but mitigating any risk at all that the WSC may ever compete in popularity. Regardless of the true intention behind the decision, the results spoke for themselves. The rule change was effectively a death blow to Group C sports car racing. The cost to compete soared immediately, and post-1990, there was a huge exodus of manufacturers from the competition, leaving top C1-class grids an almost barren wasteland. However, there was a few manufacturers that stuck it out to the end. Toyota didn't initially appear to be one of them, not competing in the WSC in 1991, before making a surprise appearance at that year's final round to test their new C1 Monster and 1992 championship hopeful, the Toyota TS-010. Powered by a 3.5 litre naturally aspirated V10 and built around a composite monocoque, the TS-010 was no joke. At the opening round of the 1992 World Sports Car Championship, the TS-010 finished in first place. A momentous occasion, but one that I now must sadly qualify. A win is a win, and they did beat Peugeot and their formidable 905. However, the TS-010 was one of only two C1-class cars to finish the race in Monza. 
To finish first, first you must finish, I know. But only Peugeot, Lola, Mazda and Toyota had fielded entrants at all, totaling six cars in the C1 class, four of which retired before the end of the race, including Toyota's second TS-010. Nonetheless, Toyota had built one hell of a car. Maybe this one could yield them the win at the illustrious 24 Hours of Le Mans. Race 2 was at Silverstone, and both Toyota's TS-010s failed to finish due to mechanical issues. The race went the way of Peugeot's 905. Race 3 was the all-important 24 Hours of Le Mans, the only race anyone really cared about at this point. In Group C1, Toyota's TS-010 would need to face off against its arch-rival Peugeot's 905 and Mazda's MXR01 in order to claim victory. And despite Toyota's best efforts, they just couldn't quite make it happen. Of the three TS-010s that started the race, two of them retired. One of them did finish, but it finished a tantalising yet devastating second place. It wasn't all disappointment for Toyota that day, though. As their V8-powered C2 Class 92CV won a class victory, coming in fourth overall, only a couple of seconds behind Mazda's MXR01 running in the class above. It wasn't the win they were hoping for, though. Le Mans set the tone for the rest of Toyota's WSC season in 1992. They had a fast car, but it was never faster than Peugeot's 905. They were always close, but they were never ahead. In the JSPC, Toyota didn't use the TS-010 for most of the season in 1992. Competing in what the FIA would describe as the C2 class with the 92CV. Their primary competition was Nissan's R92CP, a car that proved Toyota's direct foil. On paper, they were very similar cars, but on race day, Nissan always seemed to have the slightly better machine. Relegating Toyota to podiums and nearly podiums, win-free for the first four races of the season. In races 5 and 6, they wheeled out the TS-010. And, surprise surprise, they won convincingly both times, but the victories were kind of hollow as their only real competition in the higher class was Mazda's MXR01, which had already proven itself to struggle even against the lower class C2 machines. 1992 turned out to be the final year of both the old style World Sports Car Championship and the JSPC, both folded under the weight of manufacturer exodus. Waning competition and soaring development costs made onboarding new competitors near impossible. For 1993 though, Group C was still the top of the pile for Le Mans, and the race appeared to be a straight rerun of 1992. Perhaps this time, Toyota could catch their lucky break and finally beat Peugeot. Unfortunately, as I'm sure you already guessed, they had no such luck. Toyota Team Toms suffered one final massive defeat at the hands of Peugeot, who not only beat Toyota, but locked out all three podium finishing spots on race day, relegating Toyota to fourth place. They didn't even get a podium for their effort. With the prototype era now having run its course, Toyota had a decision to make. Would they keep fighting? In 1995, Toyota made its first move into GT-class racing in Europe. They raced an LM spec race modified Supra, very similar to the GT500 spec cars that were racing in the new JGTC. Adjacent to this was a custom-built MR2-based MC8R, built and fielded by Saad. Saad is a racing team and tuning parts manufacturer with a very close working relationship with Toyota, and their MC8R was created solely to race at Le Mans. Due to the extent of the modifications done to the base MR2 to create the car, a small number of production MC8R road cars had to be built for the purposes of homologation. Unsurprisingly, the custom-built, properly race-focused MC8R beat the Le Mans Spec Supras in 1995. 
and the car went on to compete again for Toyota in 1996, though it won neither year. While success in Europe continued to elude Toyota and its proxies, it became clear that custom machinery really was the only way forward. In 1996, it dawned on Toyota's racing division that the only real way to have a shot at beating Mercedes and Porsche was to exploit loopholes and enter overqualified cars into the GT class. With that, Toyota Team Europe was put in charge of Toyota's GT racing dreams in addition to their WRC duties, and they had until Le Mans 98 to design and build a winning race car. They partnered with European racing car constructor Delara, and they had absolutely no intention of doing it by the book, bending the rules to breaking point in two particular areas. The first and most outrageous loophole that Toyota exploited was that of storage space. To qualify for the GT1 class, the rules stipulated that a car must have enough storage space for a standard sized suitcase. This is a measure to ensure that the race cars aren't so different from road going GT cars. Obviously, Toyota didn't want to build a race car that had a suitcase sized void somewhere in its bodywork if they could avoid it, and so they avoided it. They instead tried to convince the ACO that because the fuel tank was larger in capacity than a standard sized suitcase, and at the time of the official inspection it was empty, having no fuel in it, it should be considered allowable storage space. Remarkably, in their reading of the rules, the ACO agreed with them, and the car was allowed to compete. The second act of rule bending was less controversial, as Toyota were far from the only manufacturer to be doing this. Though it's fair to say that the spirit of the rules had by this point long been abandoned. It regards road cars. GT1 was a homologated class after all. The entire point of GT car racing is that the cars are based on road legal production cars that ostensibly people can buy. However, Toyota was just doing the very bare minimum, and the bare minimum in this case was a single road legal production car. With their single road car built, and the ACO ticking the box next to storage space, they were ready to compete at Le Mans 1998. Though it was not exceptionally successful. Of the three cars that entered Le Mans, only one of them finished, and it finished ninth. Toyota hadn't entered the GT1 into the entire WSC, and so focus shifted to Le Mans 1999. For 1999, the rules were changed forcing the GT1 to compete in the new closed cockpit LM GTP class alongside the new Mercedes CLR. Unlike rivals Mercedes, who built an entirely new car, and Porsche, who dropped out of the competition entirely, Toyota's car from the previous year felt very, very nearly in line with the new regulations, allowing it to compete with minimal modification. Toyota GT1s finished first and second in their class at Le Mans in 1999, but not quite first overall. They were beaten by an LMP spec BMW V12 LMR, a car that theoretically should have been slower. This was yet another gut wrenching snub for Toyota, who had built a true rocket ship, and it was only misfortune that had kept them from taking the win suffering gearbox trouble, and most devastating of all, a puncture. A puncture that cost Toyota's leading GT1 its one shot at Le Mans victory. Despite the breathtaking performance of Toyota's GT1, and the cult status it has since achieved, losing Le Mans yet again in 1999 was a knockout blow to Toyota's ambitions to win the race going into the new millennium. It would be more than a decade until they tried their luck again in European endurance racing, but that is a story for another day. Through the mid to late 90s, Toyota was very involved in the JGTC, a series that this video has mostly glossed over. To hear all about their escapades in Japan, including the story of the legendary Castrol Tom Supra, you should click the video on the screen now. Leave a like if you enjoyed this video, thank you for watching, and until next time, goodbye.